All right, I'm just going to talk to Nelson. Um, I've been a veterinarian for a long time now. I graduated in 1989 from Kent State University. I went out into the private practice for 14 years. I did companion animals, so dogs, cats. I also did pocket pets and some exotics. And then in 2003, I went up to K-State, and now I teach in community practice. So basically, it's primary care for dogs and cats. So one thing we do on a daily basis, several times a day, is we talk about parasite control with our, with our clients. And so we're going to do this. Now, why do we do this? They have the potential to be life-threatening. We see animals die from weights. Some of them are contagious people, otherwise known as zoonotic, which is a fancy word. And then they're a big business. Drug companies make a lot of money, especially on clean tick control. So today we're going to discuss seven different internal parasites around worms, hookworms, hookworms, tapeworms, coccidia, giardia, and heartworm. And then we're going to do seven external parasites. I just kind of pick the ones we deal with a lot. The only one the exception would be lice. We don't deal with that one very often. And we will do flea sticks, ear mites, sarcophic mange, duodecic mange, and anyone's favorite, Kansas chickers. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you a warning. This presentation has gross stuff. So if you get nauseous, turn away. We don't want a chain reaction of puking, okay? All right, there's some fun videos coming up. All right, so roundworms. Um, there are species of roundworms that affect both dogs and cats, and then some are individual. How do they get it? They are ingesting an infected egg so they can get it from the environment. They're earthworms. Warning, those of you who eat earthworms on a dare can get infected by roundworms, okay? And then ingestion of vertebrate posts. So things like mice that are carrying that can also do that. So even a totally indoor cat could get a roundworm if they're catching mice in the house. And then from nursing from their mother. And then they can also be passed to, through the placenta in utero. And so they can be born with them. So from the time they eat an egg, and they're going to kind of pay, depends on the species, but anywhere from two to four weeks from egg to adult to eight to 10 weeks. And so these are the ones when owner calls me and says, I'm seeing norms in my dog or cat's poop. I'll ask them to describe them. Are they long and spaghetti-like? <clears throat> there you go. They are long and spaghetti-like. So symptoms. The young are usually most severely affected. And I'll show you a picture of a puppy in a little bit. Diarrhea, bloated abdomen, just poor doers, poor body, um, body um, condition. They can get impacted and obstructed with these. You can get enough of those. Enough that can cause death. These can also migrate through the lungs um, and cause some respiratory disease too. So it's figured about up to 30%, and that's more of your adult population is affected. Um, there is a little bit of resistance as they get older to this parasite, but you just assume that all puppies and kittens usually have that. So it is recommended by CAPSI. So CAPSI is the Companion Animal, Companion Animal Parasite Council. It is a conjoined effort between veterinary parasitologists and the CDC, so it's acronym the CAPC, so CAPC. They have a bunch of deworming recommendations and public health stuff on there, so it's a good way to go. And they do recommend starting deworming both puppies and kittens at two weeks of age. And then treatment options, there are a lot of options. There are some topical medications that deworm. Most of them are oral grounds. Are they zoonotic? Heck yeah, so we can get these. So for people, there's two forms. There's visceral larval migraines, meaning it's going through an organ. And then ocular larval migraines is kind of a subset of visceral, where it's going through the eyes. And the biggest population we see affected with this are kids, especially in the southeast in the United States. Um, there's a lot of parasites that like to live in those warm soils, so they can cause blindness. This is actually a picture of the worm migrating through the eyelid of a person. And then it also can set up in the lungs with people. One of our drug reps was just telling us about someone she knew who did eat an earthworm on a dare and ended up with pneumonia and bad disease in her lungs because the, the roundworms were migrating through her lungs. So if she did get treated and she's cleared up, but there again, they can be bad for people and really bad for kids for losing their eyesight. Okay, here's your typical puppy with roundworms that come in. They have a bloated, distended abdomen, yet you can see still looks kind of ribby through there. Um, these are roundworms in the intestinal tract. This is a puked up roundworm, roundworm and poop. Okay, you got that. More roundworm after a dewormy. And then this is what the actual egg looks like in there. Okay, question. How many eggs can a female roundworm lay in one day? This is, I got a thousand. Okay, any other takers? Got 300. All right, a 
I'm going to have to warm up this group. Okay. 85,000 to 200,000 eggs per day. This is an actual, came from our parasitologist, sent me this picture. This is a female around room, and these are the eggs coming out of her. All these are eggs. So they can deposit tremendous amounts of these in the soil. So the other reason Capsi makes that recommend, uh, recommendation for deworming those young puppies and kittens is because they are contaminating the environment, and there again, is a public health risk too. So besides the health of the pet, we're trying to minimize the exposure for us. Okay, next we're going to talk about hookworms. They get their name because they have these little teeth-like things, and they attach to the intestinal wall and suck blood. They're little vampires. There is a version of these that doesn't have those little teeth. They kind of are their gummers, but anyway, they don't do as much damage. These guys do a lot of damage, though. They can affect both dogs and cats, and then there is a cat species, dog species. Once again, they are ingestion of an infected larva, either through the environment or cockroaches carrying the larva. Vertebrate hosts, again, so something with a backbone that's carrying that, like a mouse or a rabbit, things like that. Milk when they're seeing skin penetration. Here, what's called the pre-painting period, there again, the, day, the time from ingestion to where we see the adults is about two to three weeks. Can be up to 28 days, depending on temperatures and things like that. So symptoms, once again, the young are most severely affected. We see a lot of puppies and kittens have perform anemia, and they can die from that and get dark tarry stools, that's the inside of the intestine from when they had died from hookworm disease, diarrhea, they're very thin, poor doers. There again, they can get pneumonia from this parasite, um, and they die. Up to 36% of the population um, can be there. Once again, we assume puppies and kittens are infected. Again, we have oral and topical medications to help you warm for this. And are they zoonotic? Yes, they are. This is called, this is cutaneous larval migrans. Cutaneous larval migrans is the most common skin disease for people who go visit tropical places. Because you're out on the beach, you have warm sandy soil, the hookworms like to live there. So you're laying on the beach or you're playing volleyball on the beach, wherever you have contact, these migrate in through there. And so we see this more in the southern United States where the hookworms are staying around. Up in this area in winter, the hookworm eggs and the larvae are gonna die. The larvae are gonna die. They're pretty persistent down in south of uh, the southern United States. Okay, how many eggs do hookworms lay per day? 200,000. I got 200,000 now. <laughs> oh, look at that. So close. 25,000 per. So, once again, not as many as around worms, but that's still a pretty high number for a little tiny hookworm, right? <laughs> Okay, and by the way, hookworms, we don't see the adults, they are microscopic, so we're only finding eggs when we're running fecal floats. Okay, whipworms, they get their name because they have kind of that little whip tail on them. There again, rarely do we see them in the stool, rarely. Um, I had one case where we saw them come out, but they're pretty um, small. They're very uncommon in cats in North America, but we do see them in dogs. There again, they just the eggs that have the larvated um, larva in there. Their pre-painting period is up to about three months, so they have a longer pre-painting period. And these eggs live a long time in soil. They've been documented at least 10 years. They are very, very hardy. Symptoms, these guys get what's called large bowel diarrhea. So they can have more mucus, they have blood streaks, and they can have severe weight loss, dehydration, anemia, death. Um, there's a disease called Addison's that dogs can get, and people can get it too. Dogs with whipworms can get something called a pseudo-Addisonian syndrome. Their blood work will look like just an Addisonian dog. The only difference is there's another test we can do to differentiate them, plus we usually find the whipworms with the dogs. Totally different treatments. They can die from both of those just as easily, severe dehydration, shock, weakness, but there is a difference in how you treat it. I've only seen one of those before. I read about it, and I got to see one a few years ago. Prevalence, a little bit lower, about 10 to 14%. So this is actually a case that we have. Um, those are all whipworms that are in the colon of this dog. Are they zoonotic? They're considered pretty unlikely. A lot of the heartworm preventives can control whipworms. Okay, how many eggs do whipworms lay per day? 50,000. I got 50. 200,000. I got 200 again. <laughs> all right. About 2,000, and the thing is, they don't lay them every day either. It makes it difficult to diagnose this in dogs. And we can have dogs dying from this disease and not find the eggs because they shed in lower numbers than the other ones and intermittently, so they're not shedding every day. So it can be a challenge sometimes, in fact, 
It's recommended if you're suspecting whipworms to run three fecals, three days in a row with fecals, seeing if you can check and find those eggs shedding out. All right, tapeworms. Okay, someone calls and says they got these little things in the poop. So I'll have them describe them long as spaghetti or like rice. For short and like rice, it's going to be tapeworms. Those are the two most common. These are dried up segments that we pulled off the rear end of a dog who came in. Um, these are freshly out, so they're a little more moist, and we'll show you something here. There's many species, including one kind of, called Echinococcus that we'll talk about. Uh, the how acquired, uh, they have to eat what's called the intermediate um, host, and that's going to be for Diplidium, where they get their fleas, or Tania species, where they get them for eating rodents and rabbits. So this part's kind of for Diplidium and Tania. Their pre painting periods, two or three weeks, up to a couple months. They, for as gross as they are, typically don't cause a lot of problems. They might be a little itchy around their rear end. A really severe infection could cause infection, but often they're asymptomatic and the owners just come in because they've seen the worms coming out of their rear ends and they're grossed out. Or they get up from where they're laying and you find them on your sofa or something like that. Prevalence. So in shelters, shelter studies, up to 50 to 60 percent of the dogs and cats are going to have tapeworms. Of owned dogs and cats, 40 to 50 percent. So even when it's taken care of, these are very common. All they have to do is eat one flea. They don't have to be infested or find one dead mouse carcass to eat, and they can get infected with the tapeworms. And they're very hard to find on routine fecals. So whenever we set what's called up a fecal float, we're looking for eggs that are floating up to the top. These are really heavy eggs. They tend to sink to the bottom. So even if they're shedding them, we don't find them very often. Okay, treatments. We have a lot of options, and now a lot of the hormone preventives are coming out with um, tapeworm treatments also. It's only kind of one option yet for echinococcus. Okay, our diplidium and tania zoonotic, it's uncommon unless you eat a flea, which if you have a flea infestation, that happens in houses, or you're sleeping with your pets and they have fleas in your bed, that can happen. How many of you have swallowed a gnat? You can swallow a flea. So it can happen. In the old days, the loose weight, they used to put tapeworms in capsules for people to buy, like in the 50s. They got, I don't recommend that. So, but anyway, uh, but it's not that common for people to go. Okay, let's see if this will work now. No, don't do that. Try this one. No, these were working. Right on the picture of the tapeworms. Yeah, so I'll just point those out. These are live tapeworms that came out, and this is a, a dried up segment. So that segment is roughly the size of a piece of rice. So that does give you kind of an idea of what they're like. Click on the picture. Oh, there we go. I clicked twice. Oh, look well. at that magic. <laughs> it's the third oh, time no. charm. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. So they kind of stretch and constrict, but they dry up pretty quickly into these little segments. So aren't those fun? We <laughs> might have some tapeworm races one day when we were bored. We had a little finish line to see who would cross first. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. We kind of work since the camera. Okay, so again, another species of tapeworm is Echinococcus. This causes serious disease in people. Um, it can form large cysts in the liver, lungs, and in the brain. It's most common in people that raise sheep. It's uncommon in North America, thank goodness so. But then once when they do get it, they usually people around sheep. Because what happens is they're getting it and there's direct contact either with their dog who's infected or the fecal matter. So the other two tapeworms I talked about, if a dog or cat walks through poop that has those tapeworms in them, they don't get infected. They have to eat that mouse or the flea. This species is different, however. If, they, if those eggs are in the fecal matter, they will get infected if they walk through that and move their feet. And people, if they're not practicing their hygiene and washing their food, things like that, like vegetables and soil, can get infected with that. Okay, so this is a kind of coccus that looks a little bit different. Um, these are liver, that's liver with cysts in it. This is an MR, a big cyst in the, in the brain. And then this is a picture of them removing the cyst out of the brain. So these are not to be taken lightly there. When we ship animals, write health certificates to some of the other countries, and then also to Hawaii, uh, a lot of them require them to be dewormed for tapeworms, and specifically they want something that kills the kind of coccus because they don't want it in their country. All right, coccidia. Coccidia affects both dogs and cats. There's different species. They get them from the environment or transport hosts like cockroaches. Um, 
variable prepaying period. So the ones who get this the worst or affected the worst are going to be puppies and kittens, and they can get severely ill from this. Uh, they get diarrhea, depression, really dehydrated, they can die from them. Adults often might shed a couple of cysts, but they're usually asymptomatic. I've only in my career seen two dogs with diarrhea that have contributed to coccidia, because it was the only parasite and the only problem we could find. Typically, this is a puppy kitten parasite that we worry about. So there's a prevalence rate treatment. There's several options. Uh, there's one we use more, which is actually an equine product that we use off-label to treat it. Are they zoonotic? The thing is, no, don't have to worry about that. But they can definitely pass it to each other. OK, Giardia. Giardia, there's several species. They tend to be species-specific. Dog species affects dogs, cats, cats, but some do cross. And if you have immunocompromised people in the house, anything goes with these parasites. So even though maybe one usually only affects dogs, you have to worry about that. So there's two forms. This is called the troph. It's the swimmer. And then there are cysts, which I'll show you a picture of. The cysts are the infective stage. So they get those through um, drinking contaminated water, or they step in fresh poo, um, and then lick their feet, and they just assist. It can also be on their fur, stuck to their fur. And they can be a booker to kind of get rid of because they kind of hang around. And unless we get the animals bathed for a while, recontamination is a very big problem with this one. Diarrhea, weight loss, dehydration. Um, these guys are just unthrifty, poor doers. Um, their poo just doesn't look like they're digesting it very well. And so we actually see quite a bit of it. Um, probably at least once a week we're treating somebody, some patient for Giardia. And like I said, people can get it. It's more common for people who are going um, camping, drinking out of lakes, streams, things like that. Uh, one of my students a couple of years ago had gone on a trip to South America. They are working with alpacas or something down there. But anyway, she contracted Giardia while she was there. They couldn't come back for a while. She lost like 20 or 30 pounds. She was severely ill. So she was very sick from her Giardia. So those two on the left are the cyst forms. And like I said, there are treatments. And the biggest issue we have is reinfections. We talk about picking up things in the environment, giving a bath on the day to last treatment, and trying to keep them from being infected. Puppies that come, and kittens that come from pet stores and shelters lots of times come in with Giardia. OK, heartworm disease. Affects dogs and cats. This is a mosquito-borne parasite, so they get it from mosquito biting them, so it's blood-borne, actually. Dogs are the preferred host. doesn't like to live in cats, but it can affect cats. Um, pre painting period, so from the time um, that they are infected from the immature to the adult is six to seven months. So what do we see? Cough, weight loss, exercise intolerance. We're seeing signs of heart disease, typically, with these guys. But it's actually right-sided heart, heart failure that they get. So we get a distended abdomen. Cats, chronic vomiters, cats tend to vomit with their heartworms, so that has to be on our differential list for a cat who's chronically vomiting. They're also more likely to get neurologic signs from heartworm. Because again, heartworms don't like to live in cats, so we get what's called more aberrant migration. They go to other parts of the body than the heart, more often in cats than they do in birds, and so often it can go to the brain. Because um, it's mosquito-borne, where we see the most of it, it's going to be southeast United States. Warm, humid, same warm all time, but don't get it wrong. We have it in Kansas. I train enough dogs for heartworm, and we do see heartworm positive cats in this area too. Problems with cats, we don't have any treatment for cats except potentially extracting the worms, and it has a very high mortality rate. So there again, treatment for dogs, yes, is expensive. Some dogs still die. This is a very advanced case. It has what's called cable syndrome because it's obstructing that combo being a kid and the dog, and so we're starting to get ascites, which is just clear fluid building up in its belly from that and the right side of heart failure that it has. Prevention, what we do is preach prevention. It's a lot better to put them on prevention and keep them from getting heartworm than trying to treat them for it. We do recommend year-round, because when, when does winter hit in Kansas? It is variable. When does spring come? It's variable. So it's easier just to keep them on year-round. Plus, a lot of these preventives are, are deworming for three, four different intestinal parasites, too, and they're a really cheap way to deworm your pet. Are they zoonotic? No, but there are cases of people having heartworm. Oops, back up. Yeah. Okay, this is one. So we're looking in the microscope. If we were looking at that live, you'd see that thing wiggling around. So these are all red blood cells. We're just looking at them under the microscope under a fairly low power, under 10x. 
And then these are the adults. They grow to be about 12 to 18 inches long. So they get to be very, very long. And they're living in those main pulmonary arteries and extending sometimes into the heart. So let's see if we can get this to work. This is a fun trick I get to do with my students. These are what are called the microfilaria. They're the babies. So that maybe you just squirm, they're in the bloodstream. So those are microscopic. So what we do is we take a little blood. Do any of you know what a hematocrit tube is? It's really skinny tube. Anyway, we put it in there, we spin it, and we separate the blood. So we have the red blood cells, and then we have the serum. And right about at that junction is where we'll find those. When we, so we're looking at this in the low magnification of the vet under the microscope, and then we can see those squiggling around in there. So they're kind of fun to do and look at. Not good for the dog or cat, but fun for us. Okay, any questions on the internal parasites? Gross down, yeah? Okay. okay, external parasites. Okay, this is a bumper year for fleas. Every other patient I have has fleas right now, and people are pulling their hairs out because some of the products we're using are starting to lose their efficacy. We're starting to see resistance to some of the things that have been around a long time, but there are newer products out there working really well. The problem is people who are still using some of these that were getting some resistance, um, and, and due to the fact that the environmental conditions are just optimal right now for fleas, we're seeing lots of fleas. I just took these a couple weeks ago, took some pictures of these. So I know that's a little hard to see up at the top, but these are some fleas we pulled off. They're dead fleas. We pulled off the dog. You'll see his video in a moment. We just put them under some scotch tape on a slide. But I want to point out here is I know they're all small, but look at the size difference between that one and the one up top. That one up top is a juvenile, so it's a baby form, and the one on the bottom is an adult. They're a little bit bigger. This is an adult. This is a juvenile. So when we're trying to decide if we're having a resistance to our product, we're looking to see what's coming off the animal. If we are seeing a lot of adults, either our product's not working or the owner's not applying correctly. Or maybe they're, it's a topical and they're bathing their dog so much it's just washing it off. Versus if we see a lot of the babies, but no adults, the product's working. The babies are just coming on from the environment. They keep hatching out, hatching out, but they're not making it to adulthood. But if we see a lot of adults who, Adults also, our products either not working or not being applied correctly. So um, they don't care who they bite. The most common flea is the cat flea. And Dr. Dryden, who works at Kansas State, is like his, his name is Dr. Flea, because all his research is done on fleas. Okay, how acquired? So they come from the environment. So the eggs aren't sticky. They're laid on the animal, but then they fall off. And so they're in the environment. So like in the house, where you'll see the most of them, is where they spend a lot of time laying around. So much your eggs and then the larvae are going to be. Their pupating period depends on environmental temperatures. So as short as under a couple of weeks, for um, today's a little cooler, but when it's in the 70s, these guys probably get like mad and mature quickly. Or they stay dormant and it takes a while for them to hatch out. Symptoms, itching, hair loss, especially if they're allergic to them, anemia, death, and they are curious of other diseases. We talked about tapeworms that can get them from eating one of these guys. They're widespread, but they're in common when we have a relatively low humidity. So when you go to like the desert areas, you're not going to see much of these typically. So treatment, we have a lot of options. There's topical, there's oral. Main thing is you don't wait till there's a problem to start. If you wait until you start seeing the fleas, you're behind the eight ball. There's already literally thousands and probably millions of them in the environment at that time. And it will take a while to get it under control. Are they zoonotic? Yes. It will bite people too, especially when there isn't enough animal around to feed on. And so things we get, cat scratch disease is actually from fleas affecting those cats. Typhus, tapeworms, plague, rash, so people can get allergic dermatitis from the bites too. Anyone know what that is at the bottom left? And it's kind of hard to see. It's very, very tiny. Looks like little specks of dirt if it was on that table. Poop. It's flea poop. <laughs> and so what we do when we're trying to convince an owner that pet has fleas when they're arguing with us is we take something white and we wet it down with water. And we wipe that stuff up. And it does this. Flea poop's digestive blood. And so what it does when it rehydrates with the water, we just see it turn bloody. This is the way I can tell owners that there's fleas on their pets. This dog has a really bad flea allergic dermatitis. And this is almost what we call pathognomonic, meaning this is classic. You get this area from the tail to the lower back and usually down the back of the legs and on the inside of the groin that break out and they have their hair loss. So this is a classic flea allergic dermatitis dog. 
some of these dogs, it doesn't take very many fleas to make them look like that. So allergic to them. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, we had a bunch of eggs falling off a patient. So we took some scotch tape, put it on a slide, and we just let it sit there for days. And every day, we looked at it in the microscope. And guess what they started doing? They started hatching out. This is what they do on your carpet and out in your environment. So those are the eggs, and you see a couple of those are working their way out. Sorry, there's a little jump to the videos here. You can't seem to make that stop, but I think you get the gist. And there will be tons of those in the environment right now. Oops. Okay, this is another video. So this is the dog these fleas came off of. And you know they're running. This dog came in, the owners couldn't figure out why he was scratching. They were using front line on it. Now they were bathing him a lot. And we turned him over and went, eh, it's fleece. And I don't know if I can stop this enough, so I have to replay it. You notice these red areas here? There again, that dog has a bit of um, dermatitis from those fleece. We've got a big, some big fat ones there that are feeding on it too and running all over. Okay, this is the same dog. So there's a product called Capstar. Um, it's a very, very safe product and very effective. The problem is it doesn't stay in their system very long. Once we give it to them, within about 30 minutes, fleas start to die. When you have dogs like him that have so many fleas, as they're starting to die, they start to I apologize for the jump, but see that back leg that's literally tremoring on him. He is going nuts, so from all those fleas crawling around on him because they're kind of doing their little death run right now on him, they'll eventually fall off and you'll see him dead on the table. But until then, for about an hour, these guys will be going crazy like that. And we have to tell owners that because if we give them the capstone and just send them home, and 30 minutes later they're doing that, the owners think there's a problem with their pet. And he is, he's being driven nuts by the fleas, but eventually that will calm down. So this poor little guy was just being driven crazy by his fleas. Okay. A couple of falls ago, we had this called a good sand puppy. Someone brought it in. They found it. He was very weak and very run down, skinny, um, and he was loaded in fleas. Our technician was holding him and they were jumping off all over the hurt. So these are what are called the hematocrit tubes. Remember the heartworm tube I showed you? That's, that's a hematocrit tube. But what we use those mostly for is to see if they're anemic or not. So we spin the blood down. We put it against a little card. We read the percentage to see what the percentage is. This is a normal dog, just to get and give you a little bit of um, relevance there. That was the hematocrit of that puppy. He was dying because, in fact, he almost died. We barely got a blood transfusion into him. And he named him Phoenix because literally on the heart monitor, his heart got down to about 30. And so, and then after the blood got in, we just said to him slow with the blood. They just pushed it into him. And the dog actually lived. That is a severe. I think his normal hematocrit is going to be around 40, 42 for a dog. His, I think, was at six or seven. So it was very low. Okay, ticks, I hate ticks. Okay, I hate fleas too, but I really hate ticks. They're so invasive. So we have a lot of species in Kansas. Um, ticks do not fall out of trees. Let's get that myth out of the way. Ticks like to live in tall grass, in brush, and they do what's called questing. They sit there, and I don't have a picture this one's not quite on the end, but he's going to start to start to quest. They sit there on the end of the blade of grass or on the brush, and they wait for something to walk by, and they hit your ride. So they're not falling from the trees. So when you're out walking the cones of prairie or something, they're coming from down below. And so and they have what's called the questing behavior. pre painting period, it just depends on the species. And some of them need other species um, to complete the life cycle. Deer. Um, and the um, turkeys around here are a big source that we need for that. And so where there's a lot of deer and turkeys, there are going to be a lot of ticks too. Symptoms, hair loss, anemia, paralysis, death, they are carriers of many diseases. Prevalence it is, is regional, so we don't have the type of tick. Well, your area is getting close. The exoides tick that um, causes Lyme disease is right in eastern Kansas, but in Manhattan, really not having that yet. They, down a couple, but it's not a big issue yet. But the areas are expanding. Anyone know what kind of tick that is? Common name is called a lone star tick because it has a little star on it. So that is very prevalent in Kansas and it's encroaching, and so a lot of diseases we have are carried by that. But we do have several species. 
There's a lot of options, topical, and the new oral tick treatments are wonderful that are out that just came out about a year, year and a half ago. There again, you don't want to wait until there's a problem. You want to be proactive. Are they zoonotic? Yes. Meaning your dog can bring them to you or you're walking in the grass and you're going to get them. What can you get? Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Lyme, Tularemia, or Lichiosis, Starry. Your Lichia, Tularemia, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and Starry are all seen in Kansas. There are reports of Lyme, but usually people have traveled in the state for that, for, for the most part. Okay, ear mites. They pet dogs and cats equally, and carrots and rabbits. So how are they acquired? Close contact, they crawl up from one dog onto the other, and they set up shop in the ears. Roughly two to three weeks uh, or so for a pre painting period. Symptoms are these guys are digging out of their ears or head shaking. Now they could have other infections, especially when they're young, puppies and kittens, or a cat. We see a lot more cats with ear mites than we do dogs. You gotta be thinking ear mites. So treatment, we have a lot of options. There's topical medications we can put on them to clear those out. Um, we also have uh, just one skin that goes systemically. There's medications we can actually put in the ears to help kill those ear mites too. We usually have to have them professionally cleaned out because these guys are chock full of stuff in there. And some of the medications aren't going to treat, aren't going to work very well for treatment if there's a lot of them in those ears. And so, and then often they have secondary bacterial and yeast infections that we have to treat too. Um, occasionally, I see dogs or cats coming in with a head tilt and vertigo because it's affecting their inner ear. There's so much inflammation going on. You see these guys falling over and even seizures sometimes. So they're very common. Are they zoonotic? Very rare. There is a gentleman several years ago who actually inoculated himself with ear mites because he wanted to know what it was like and how long they would live in people. Well, they don't really like to live in people. He was very uncomfortable for a long time until they died. So I don't recommend that experiment, but you know, people do crazy things. So let's see if this works. This is very short. This in the still form gives you a good idea what they look like. We can see, with your really young eyes, if you had a cat and you saw a strand of hair coming up, it looked like a little speck of dust crawling up. But when I was young, I could see those. Normally, you're using a photoscope or looking at them under the microscope in the low power. But they're fairly big. And this is x-rated because they are procreating there. So this is under some mineral oil and under the microscope. So they're just moving right along. And I should point out, let's see if I can get that. On this slide, there is the eggs that are up here. So sometimes, and I have to tell my students this, especially when it's an early infest infection, all we're going to find are the eggs. So they have to be on the lookout for the eggs because sometimes they don't only see those squirmy little mites in there. Okay, lice. Lice are really uncommon for us to see in a own cared for animal. Where we're going to see these the most of the ones like hoarders, um, where they're not, where those animals are not getting good care, um, maybe really bad shelters, things like that, who aren't providing a lot of care. So they're usually immunosuppressed and immunocompromised or in poor health for other reasons. How they get it, it crosses just from cat to cat, dog to dog. One thing with lice are they're usually species specific, so only cat lice affect cats, dog lice affect dogs. They can also, just like with people, be transferred in what are called fomites. So fomites would be like a comb or a brush, something we'd use on one and then go use it on the other. So we can transfer it that way too. Their pre paint carries about three weeks. They're often asymptomatic, you might just notice the little nits and things in there. Um, cats can get really heavy infestations, have restlessness. I, I think I've only seen one or two cases of lice ever. Um, I just don't see the ones that really come from the dilapidated areas in front of like, the orders and things like that. So people who are working for the state and going to some of these breeding operations and things like that, doing the raids will find a lot of them in that kind of condition. So they're again, very young, very old, very debilitated. The ones that are more likely to get it. Usually that's, we're seeing it in the colder weather where they're all more crowded together for warmth and staying together. And if they're on a flea or tick preventive, most of them kill lice, so you're really going to find that on it. So there are different kinds of lice that are out there. So these are the most three common ones that we see. So we have sucking lice and chewing lice that are there. Um, and there again, the only good thing is they're not going to affect you. Okay, sarcoptic mange um, is found primarily in dogs and primarily in cats. There again, direct contact, dog to dog, or spread by phone lice, so you're, sh you're sharing 
um, grooming material or little jackets or things like that. Our pink paint period is about three weeks. And I'll show you a picture of a dog here too. These guys can be anywhere from asymptomatic to where they look horrendous. The skin is thickened, they've got a lot of hair loss, and they are nonstop itching all the time. So they get bloody skin lesions, they're self-mutilating themselves. So it is relatively common. The problem is it's very hard to diagnose. And a lot of times we empirically treat to look for response because it can be hard to find what we call skin scrapes. It's very difficult to find. It can vary pretty deep. We happen to get lucky on this one, found some mice and some eggs for that. So this dog came in actually through our dermatology service and and they have the full, it was awful the skin. This is a beagle. So look how thick the skin is and how crusty and it's just not in good shape. Um, there are only two approved treatment options at that time, but we're finding some of these newer flea and tick products are starting to work for it also. And oftentimes they have secondary bacterial and yeast infections. So even if we kill the mites, if we don't address those other infections, we're still itchy and uncomfortable. And yes, it's zoonotic. So sometimes what happens is people bring their dog in for itching, um, and when I'm trying to decide if it's, if it's sarcoptic mange, I may ask them if they have rashes, anyone that has, has rashes on their arms or chest, which is where they're holding the dog up. And some of them, especially after we treat the dog, their rashes go away. The thing is, it doesn't like to live on people. It can't complete the life cycle. So people can be uncomfortable for a couple of weeks, but it can't reproduce and continue on in people. So they're not a good thing. Um, the other thing is when we first treat these guys, they often get a lot itchier because these mites burrow under the skin. And when they die, they're dying under the skin, so they cause a lot of inflammation. So the other thing I have to warn my clients about is they're going to be worse at first before we get them better, so they just kind of have to stay the course with the treatment. And they do want to treat all the dogs that are in contact with their dog. Okay, demodectic mange is another type of mite that we see in dogs and cats. It's very easy for us to find on skin scrapes. Um, there's different kinds. They're species specific. Dog, dog index likes dog, cats like cats. And so, and yeah, there's mostly long body in dogs and cats, and then cats have a short body form. How acquired? So these are technically considered non-contagious, but a little way they are. Like an adult to an adult, they're usually not going to pass it. There's very few cases of that. Not only what happens is when they're born, when they start nursing off a mom, they get them from the mom's skin because they are part of the normal flora. People have their own kind of DMDX mites. They like to live in our eyelashes and things. So they acquire in that way. The problem is if they're immunosuppressed or immunocompromised, their body can't keep them in check, and then we start seeing skin problems from those. So pre pain periods around two to four weeks or so. Most dogs aren't itchy from these. We just see patchy areas of hair loss on them. But they can, have, they can be red, and occasionally they get secondary infections and they are itchy. In cats, there's a short body form that actually is considered contagious, so it can go from cat to cat. It can also be very hard to find because of the cat's grooming habits. In fact, a lot of times we diagnose it more often by finding it in an fecal sample because they ingest it and then it just passes on through. So we'll find it there. So there again, Young dogs with a demodex, if it's an older dog that breaks with demodex, we've got to think about what's going on in that dog that's suppressing its immune system. So we start going on a disease hunt, basically. This demodex just doesn't pop, doesn't pop up in a healthy animal. Treatment, at this time, there's only dips, which we rarely use anywhere that are labeled. So we use a lot of things that are called off-label on them. And there again, uh, two of our new flea tick products that come out are working great for demodex. So dips are in my going away in the past. Cats, we don't have any label treatments for the cats. Um, and it's usually a series of dips. So who wants to dip their cat once a week for six weeks in a row? Nobody. That's what they have to do with this. Uh, and then we do have systemic products for long body for cats. The good news is they're not so naughty. They're cool to look at. So this is a cat who had come in for just over grooming, just fur mowing and mowing everything off. And actually, it had short body demodex. So they do look a little different. This is a normal long body demodex that has a longer tail. This gal, she came in, she was young, and she had it just set up around her eye. Like imagine, we can't really dip around that eye, so we had to go with systemic products with her. And then sometimes we'll find this on hair plucks. So normally we do what are called skin scrapes. We take a blade and we're scraping and getting just surface cells off the skin. But areas between the toes or around the eyes, you imagine it's trying to take a blade and scrape around that dog's eye, especially if it's wiggly, doesn't happen. 
we can pluck hairs. And if you look right here, that is a demon that's laying along the shaft of that hair. So sometimes we can diagnose it by plucking hair versus having the spray. All right, chiggers. They bite us, but they also like to bite our dogs and cats. And people just don't really realize that they do that. There again, they're going to be in the grass and low-lying vegetation, so if maybe you've been laying on the ground, you might have come up with sugar bites. Pre-paint uh, pre here is a little bit longer. Red bumps, they can get them anywhere, but the dogs, we see them a lot between their toes and then on their bellies, where they seem, the ones that like to roll in the grass, we'll see them on the back, too. So prevalence is regional. Not every place in the United States has them. We have had students come like from the coast who've never had encountered sugars. They come spend the summer in Manhattan and the heart these things. So more prevalent in the summer and fall, and then they need warm and humid temps. So they'll be starting to go away by now. Treatment. So here's the thing. Most of our flea and tick products will kill the chiggers, but the problem is they have to bite them first. So really what we need to try to do is use things that repel them off of them, just like with us. We don't want to keep them from even biting us in the first place, which we have some options for dogs, but don't have as many good options for cats. So I think you've all seen these maybe on people before. This is actually a cat. We don't see them that often in cats. Most of the time I see them there in the ears. This cat belonged to a vet student. She brought her in because she was all bumpy. And we actually found in all these little pustules, we found chiggers. You can actually in a head of like a pimple or a pustule, but they still have the pustule there. A lot of times you'll see the little orange top of the chigger right in the middle of that. But we can scrape those up too. And the problem is they get secondary infections. So even when we kill the chigger, we still have to treat the secondary infections. All right, we're going to wind down here. We're going to play Name That Parasite, okay? All right, let's see if I can get this to work. Anyone know what that is? There's no video with this one. Is that like a blowworm? A what? A blowworm? Kind of, yeah. So it's called a cuterebra. These are so fun. We didn't have them this summer. I was very disappointed. This is from last summer. We had a good sand kitten come in. We had one behind, right at the base behind each ear. And so we were removing it. What do we have to be careful about when we remove these? Anybody know? Leaving the inside. You don't want to leave inside, and what else? We don't want to pop it. You don't want to pinch that like a pimple and try to, you have to be really careful when you're getting that out. If those pop inside, they can get the animal can have an anaphylactic reaction to them and sometimes die. So we have to be very careful when we're taking this out. And so where do they come from? No, they come from a black fly, so it's a type of fly, so these come from flies. So what happens, these flies lay their eggs, a lot of times around like rabbit burrows and on the ground. And so some dog or cat goes walking by, a lot of times they're sniffing and so they inhale it, they actually get inhaled and then the, the eggs do and then they hatch out and they migrate to a different part of the body. Sometimes they'll enter an open wound, that egg will get in an open wound too. So rabbits get these, because a lot of times they're, again, they're deposited by rabbit burrows, so they're kind of fun. But we get all excited when we see them. Okay. All right. This one has video. I hate it when these come in. Any takers on this one? Air nuggets. Air nuggets. This dog, okay, this was the least worst picture I could show you. Let's put it that way. Um, this dog came in dripping in them dripping. Um, I have a picture on my phone. I could show you what, what it looked like in the cage where she was at. They were just falling off all over. So maggots usually are going to affect animals that are too weak and too debilitated to take care of themselves. This was an older shepherd. She couldn't get up. She had bad hips. And the lady had been out of town and her mother was taking, her elderly mother was taking care of the dog. And it's summer. And the flies are there. Well, the dog basically got kind of bed sores. And a lot of times Equal matter gets around their tail, and the flies get attracted and they lay eggs and then we get the maggots. So the good thing is the capstar that we gave that little Scotty that had the fleas will actually kill maggots too. This capstar will kill anything that's an insect. And actually I found that on our kitten because we couldn't remove those for a whole day. I had to get all my other stuff done. We gave it a capstar in the morning and killed the cuterebra too. Although we still had to pluck out the cuterebra because cuterebras are insects. They come from flies. All right. This is my trick on What's that? Says a kitten. 
you know what we're doing to it? Black light? Yeah, that's called a wood slant. So it's a type of black light. What are we checking for? You guys know? Okay. We're checking for ringworm. So it's called ringworm, right? People get ringworm also. Is it a worm? I see nose. What is it? It's a, it's like um, a skin. It's, I just have this in the bio. But you know it's not a worm, right? So in people, you get those kind of circular lesions. It's a fungal infection. So it's a type of fungal infection. But a lot of people think it is from worms because it's called a worm. I appreciate your question. All right. So. We definitely, as a veterinarian, if you have a career in that or you become a technician or whatever, you will be talking a lot about parasites and parasite control products with clients, both on the large animal and small animal side. I do the small animals. There's tons of parasites on the large animal side. There are numerous options on the market, and you have to help them navigate through which ones might be best for the pet. So what's good for one pet may not be good for another, and so you have to work through that. And this is a not all, not all flea products are created equal. So these, when this person, these are her three dogs, bought an over-the-counter flea product and applied it to her dogs. They're looking good here. They're healing. So they lost their hair. They got terrible chemical burns all the way down their back. And this was only like four or five years ago. This isn't a really old product. And so sometimes we have, uh, two of the dogs were related and one was not. Sometimes we have adverse reactions. Just two days ago, I had a lady call me for cats had fleas. Not, not a surprise, and we're getting that call every day. She went to the co-op and got a shampoo that said it was safe for dogs and for cats. Well, her cats weren't doing well. And so I asked her, and I've never seen her, her cats, I asked her to, if she saw the bottle, to read me the label. And what, what it was made out of was something called permethrin. Well, permethrin can be used on dogs, but they're toxic for cats. And she threw the bottle away because I really want to see what what it was, I'm going to have to Google it and see if I can find it, because technically she could have a lawsuit against that company, because permethrins are well known to be toxic for cats. In fact, a lot of our flea products for dogs contain permethrins to help treat ticks, and they'll say right on the label to not put these on cats. Okay, so you have to look at options, or if you become a veterinarian, you'll be discussing this, what we talked about, and it depends on their health, their age, and other things, what we're going to do. So now, hey, I'm not too, I'm a fast talker. <laughs> you go home, have a nice dinner, but don't eat the worms, right? No worms. And then maybe you'll have some rice or some spaghetti tonight. <laughs> <laughs> <You'll figure laughs> <out. laughs> so, all right, so what questions do you have? Yeah. What's the best way to use the outside worm? There's two different ways. I use my fingers a lot, but you should wear gloves. Because, especially if that tick is engorged, if you pop it, and you have like cuts on your finger, you, you can get some of those organisms that tick is carrying into you. And so you need to be very careful. So especially wear gloves. They also make little tick removers, kind of like a little, kind of like a little V-shaped thing that you slide in there, and you want to slowly and steadily pull it out. You don't want to yank them, or you're likely to break off those mouth parts into there. So slow and steady. No gas, no Vaseline, no, no kerosene on them. Gas for the pets. doesn't work that well. And then if there's a lot of them on there, so some of our clean tick products work pretty quickly, we'll pop them on those. Um, some of your sprays will start killing them pretty quickly. Also some of the more older traditional sprays. It's a good question. You do have to be careful though. Um, I think about myself as a kid, my brothers and I, we pull up the fat ticks off our dog and we go step on them and smit and watch them pop and have a good time. And now that I know what I know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I probably have some kind of disease. So. Anyway, so you do want to kind of make sure at the minimum, if you're pulling off, very minimum, washing your hands when you're done pulling them off if you don't have gloves. Anything else? You want to be a parasitologist now, don't you? This is cool. Gloves are fun. This is just a few of them. We, we've had a lot of flea stuff, so we've been having a fun time taking videos with the microscope and doing all that. Okay.